नमस्कार एंड गुड आफ्टरनून आई थिंक लेट्स स्टार्ट दिस सेशन टू आवर्स नॉर्मली इन अवर सेमिनार वर्ल्ड इट दिस यूज्ड टू बी कॉल्ड पोस्ट लंच सेशंस एंड दिस यूज्ड टू बी टफ आई थिंक द गुड पार्ट विद द वेबिनार फॉर्मेट इज दैट दिस कैन बी कॉल्ड विद लंच सेशंस आल्सो यू नो एंड इमेजिन द विद लंच सेशन इज डिस्टर्ब्ड फिलैंथ्रोपी नेक्स्ट फिलैंथ्रोपी नेक्स्ट फिलैंथ्रोपी एंड टू आवर्स ऑफ लॉट ऑफ डिस्कशन एंड knowing a lot of work of many institutions on some of the toughest uh, subjects some of some of the toughest challenges we all are going through because i think is is easy to say uh, post covid fine but as i've been saying again and again that uh, there is nothing called post covid now it's all with covid and it will take its own time because even once we are out uh, of the health crisis the whole lot of other crises which are created because of this pandemic will remain there and will take years and decades to really come back to the normal and maybe to the uh, new normal uh today uh, we also have four very uh, you know distinguished speakers but more than that the doers uh, in the in the field who will share their own uh, experiences and i will keep introducing them but before that the subject uh, which is uh, more important and uh, just to us to cover four uh, major themes is is not a, a small task but uh, i think we will be able to give some glimpses of all these four issues one for sure is the marginalized communities and the definition of marginalized communities also is changing i mean i remember at gunj uh, last year we started something called missed out communities because very soon we realized that marginalized communities i mean right from people with leprosy to people with disability to sex workers to you know whole lot of other other communities who in any case need special attention uh, even in the normal time but the time has come when the so called normal and when i am saying normal i'm just talking about the financially normal people who can at least afford two meals a day uh, they are pushed back and they have taken that space of the marginalized communities we can understand that the originally marginalized communities are pushed back further I mean, I remember uh, we we work very extensively with the uh, people with leprosy, and it is an absolutely subject. Uh, and and in India, we still have almost about eight hundred colonies of people with leprosy, and this is also even today one of the biggest cause, uh, you know, for for the for the permanent disability. And I remember in one of the conversation how uh, you know the the very simple fact came up, which was very disturbing, that large number of people suffered. in these many months uh, people affected with the leprosy and their families not only because of uh, food shortage but because people didn't have access to simple bandage or or a betadine ointment because that was not in the list of need asha worker who was providing uh, you know support to the people she is now busy in covid care that way and i remember in another conversation we found that how uh, you know the the patients are literally forced to put phenyl and kerosene on their wounds just because the medicine is not there so so this is what i'm saying that there is a huge amount of these marginalized communities which we will be uh, covering today uh, the second uh, gender issue which is again become much more important it has been important but then uh, there are a lot of issues because ultimately and and the third issue which is mental health and i see i see uh, a lot of you know uh, mix in these two issues because we know that a large part of our country ultimately survives in a single room uh, they live they, they live happily because they have lot of open space they can go out they can sit out and all that and we suddenly found in these la- last 15 16 months so many times they got together they were forced to remain in a small room there were no open spaces available which certainly had a huge impact uh, you know on the gender issues uh, for sure the dom- the domestic violence and so many other things and also on the on the mental health and mental health we'll discuss further because there are so many other components of that and the last uh, point which we will discuss today is again the most important point which is our north east states i mean uh, and i'll repeat it today in the session also i remember when i was a kid and i was growing and uh, we used to read uh, newspapers in hindi and english uh, in hindi the only news about the northeastern floods 
in those days. On the page three of those days, now the page three has a different meaning. It used to say northeast, Purvottar Bharat, pure desh se kata. Northeast is cut off from the country. That was all about the floods in uh, northeast. Right. Uh, so these this time also, northeastern states have gone through a very tough phase in terms of uh, COVID and the after impact of COVID. And also, uh, these many months are also full of disasters. I mean, the number of cyclones which we have seen in these last many months. We have not seen in the last few years in in the, in the period of one year. So these are four topics uh, which we will take up. Very interesting format. Uh, uh, the format is that one video about one uh, beautiful doer organization on one uh, subject, and then uh, one expert who has spent his or her life in uh, dealing with such subjects to uh, give the perspectives. So we'll spend about an hour like this uh, with uh, four small three, four, two minutes videos and uh, four experts' comments of 10 minutes each. And then uh, we all will come back to the discussion and the charcha where uh, we will also invite uh, comments and questions from the audience. And of course, there is a lot to discuss and there is much lesser uh, time uh, with us uh, right now. So uh, we will start with a uh, video uh, from a very beautiful institution, uh, institution called Jan Sahas, uh, which has done absolutely amazing work uh, in this particular field phase, especially uh, when they saw uh, millions of people walking and that entire community which were walking on the road. And this year also, large number of people were not walking, but went back to their natives, to their uh, areas from where they had come uh, to in, in buses and trucks and, and, and whatever. So work with the uh, marginalized community. So, so the first topic for today is marginalized community. Uh, I will uh, ask uh, Gautam to run or uh, play the video of uh, Jan Sahas and then I'll invite uh, uh, Mr. Paul Divakar. I'll introduce him briefly and then he will uh, basically comment on that and will come up with his issues, uh, his learnings uh, and his work on this particular issue. What do you Gautam? In India, during the pandemic, some of the social group face multiple challenges and vulnerability in their day-to-day -day life, such as migrant worker. According to the government data in India, we have about 140 million migrant workers. But as per estimate of some non-government organization and academicians in India, we have between 200 million to 240 million migrant workers. So about 50% of India's unorganized sector workforce come from the migrant community. But we haven't any real time data or tracking system for the migrants. As per our LMT longitude migration tracking survey, 93% migrant workers come from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe and other social excluded communities. Their social status also contribute for their vulnerability. Women migrant workers are more vulnerable and invisible. In India, we have multiple social security program for migrant workers and other excluded communities. But the challenge is no any solid delivery mechanism is exists at a ground level. And as far as the migrant workers are concerned, the portability is playing a very, very important and crucial role. And because of non availability of portability in the social security schemes, migrant workers are not able to access the benefit of these social security schemes. During the pandemic, my organization reached out to about 2 million migrant worker household with the food, ration, transportation support, mental health counseling and helping them for access to entitlement. And that's the immediate response to the pandemic or COVID-19. And now for the medium term and the long term response to ensure community resilience and recovery, we started Migrant Resilience Collaborative. Migrant Resilience Collaborative is a multi stakeholder collaborative where we are working with the community, philanthropy, industry, civil society organization and the government department and all the stakeholders 
come together and work together to impact the life of the migrant workers. Currently, we are working in 100 districts of India, 80 source districts and 20 destination districts. In this initiative, basically, we try to work at all levels, source, transit point and the destination. As of now, we reach out to about 1.2 million migrant workers and our goal to help about 10 million migrant workers in next three to five year period of time. We are using technology a lot for uh, uh, like creating an impact on the lives. Uh, we are using technology for access the entitlement for the migrant communities. And we also started a national toll free helpline for the migrant workers to ensure worker protection because sometime worker facing various kind of challenges related to the wage recovery, uh, uh, violence at the workplace and many other related issues. So through this all whole program, we are trying to ensure dignity and respect for the community and also long term resilience and recovery from the pandemic. Thank you. Uh, this was Asi Bhai. Uh, what a beautiful work this institution has been doing. We all are watching uh, that. And before I call, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Paul and introduce him, let, we, were, we were just talking about that how this uh, the, the definition of marginalized community is also ultimately changing in the in the COVID phase. I remember uh, we were talk we were we were working with the Kavals uh, in uh, in Delhi, and you know. Uh, with which, which we can't even imagine that they will also one day come in the marginalized you know community maybe even for some time only and hopefully they will come back so these are like you know third fourth generation of the sufi kabals okay and the only thing they have done so beautifully with their art uh, and tradition is that sufi kabali now imagine for the last uh, 17 18 months there is no kabali so there is no source of funding and the irony is that these people can't even go uh, on the road to get the relief material, even at the state of hunger, because whenever they moved out, they were wearing some Sherwanis in their earlier avatar, right? And they were very well respected people there. So I remember that one Kaval when we were talking and working with them, is like uh, even if we go out and someone see us in the link in in the queue, people often comment ki yar, aap hamara hak aage, that you have also come to take our right. Although the fact remains that they are also going through the same hunger and same issues and and also huge amount of dignity issues right now which are which are challenged so uh, you know i'm i'm calling uh, mr paul divakar and i i was just telling you know the team also that i am so blessed today that, um, that these two hours will give me a lot of chance to learn a lot from the seniors of this sector we are we too new that way uh, you know out here so uh, paul ji we will uh, see and you know we 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 also want you to cover the need for philanthropy, okay, to understand the dynamics uh, which are there whenever we talk about working with the uh, marginalized uh, community. And I know that large number of people in the audience uh, know you well, but uh, I'll not go through your entire CV, which is really, really huge. Only a few lines about, uh, you know, uh, Paul Devakar. Uh, he's an advocate for uh, Dalit rights, an expert on economic rights and human rights uh, defender on inclusion and issues around untouchability and atrocities. He is one of the founding members of National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights and currently the General Secretary NCDHR for Global Network and Advocacy. He has been active in popularizing the Sustainable Development Goals and bringing in the aspect of inclusion in the discourses on the emerging development paradigm. Over to you. Thank you very much Anshu. and. Uh really congratulate Chacha 2021 and also the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy for uh, inviting this and then taking this very, very important aspect. And I'm sure I really uh, the insight that you have given, the shades of marginalized are really uh, uh, shifting. And unless and until we, we uncover these layers, uh, then the communities which really need our solidarity and support may be so much hidden that it's extremely difficult for us and therefore the inequality and the level playing field will continue to be the same and will pose a, a challenge. So today I'm extremely happy to be part of this panel and also excited to see this fantastic video 
by Asif, a good friend of mine and Jansa House, the organization that he has tremendously initiated in the last uh, over a decade. But in the last five years, uh, he has really reached out. And, and I think just his experience of how come that the issue of marginalization. And then when you may have, we have seen that even among this issue of uh, migrant labor, he says 93% of them come from the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, minorities, and the OBCs. So the broad structure, which has created this kind of immense social barriers, uh, which is which is somehow sitting on our uh, on our caste system, which has for no fault of anybody excludes and uh, throws out uh, millions of people and privileges and shows gives some extreme amount of uh, so-called talent to some, and I think those are the sometimes are the ones who will be continuously be recognized. So today I think we have come a far. Uh, that that we are beginning to recognize who these marginalized are and how are we going to uh, look at this. I think it is it is very clear if we say that several decades have passed before development has touched these marginalized communities. And I think even in philanthropy, uh, several years have passed. I think only in the last few years that we are able to begin to touch the the, the 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 real core not not only the core i think only the begin to scratch the surface of the dynamics of working with the marginalized i think one example we should take and not not often <laughs> would i would i advocate for taking union government as an example but i think over the years in this particular area i must say even though i have had so many challenges i must say uh, I would like to point out a special policy called Special Component Plan for Scheduled Caste and Tribal Subplan for the uh, Scheduled Tribes that the Union Government has started. You know our five uh, five year plans, uh, which have started, uh, you know, in 1950s, and only after five five year plans, that is after 25 years of implementing these uh, these plans, did the government realize that the general development is really not reaching the communities who are supposed to be reaching. The development indicators, especially of the scheduled cars, scheduled tribes, whether it's education, health, or access to amenities, have not improved at all. And this was in 1974 and later in 1979. Um, then the then government has introduced this special component plan for scheduled cars, and then just previously, the tribal subplan. What it does is, in the total earlier we used to have plan, non-plan. I think now we have uh, the development budget and the other budget. So I think in the development budget or the plan budget, a portion of the amount which is up, which is equal to the proportion of the population of the scheduled cars and scheduled tribes is set aside, and more than the funds, the perspective of looking at in innovative development programs where they are participating in designing and in executing these programs has been thought of. And that is the core of the special component plan, tribal subplan. And I think that has really changed the, uh, the whole canvas of the development of the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. Why do I say that? Now, we recognize we have a lot of, uh, even prior to our current uh, new education policy, we have uh, other education policies. And they felt that the primary education is something that has to be uh, focused on for the most marginalized communities. They started building infrastructure, but still the learnings and the out of school children among the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes have remained very high. And then they realized they got in the Sarvasik Shabyan and they realized that it's not enough. You have infrastructure. There are barriers which are very particular to scheduled caste children. Even though they are talented, the teacher would not uh, allow them to sit in the first row. Their books, their work is not being evaluated. They are forced to be cleaning the classrooms and several such things. And this is the routine. Nobody thinks that this is a violation or an atrocity or, or, or a great wrong that is being committed. This is, this is what the normal. If any work has to be done, 
if any you, you heard of uh, even even recently when a dead carcass is to be removed they'll call the person from that chamar community or the other dalit communities and then they call their parents to say you get your parents to clean this carcass from the uh, campus so when you have such kind of a uh, a, a complete indignity and an exclusion of dalit children in schools what is the amount of a program which is spending millions and crores but is not able to reach the communities which is supposed to reach so this program special competent plan for scheduled castes and tribal sub plan for scheduled tribes has started planning for the development of the scheduled castes and then they had education they had employment uh, agriculture and several so on and so forth i'm not saying this is there is still a lot of challenges that still needs to go but the learning that we have done from this is two things one definitely there needs to be a proportion of funds for the development total development that is set that need we need to set apart for the marginalized communities and as anshu was saying this marginalized communities we need to continuously uh, revise our our system as who are these marginalized communities how do we have indicators which say that these are marginalized communities and of course it's not just access to development it is also basic human rights atrocities violence exclusion and indignity and several others which 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 are seen so from there we see it's not just allotment of funds but we also need to see that the participation of the community in designing and in execution is very very critical and from there we we look at seeing it's not sufficient that it is enough that we look at the designing but also ensure that the agency of these communities need to be strengthened if you're talking of long term and so coming i think closing the lessons that we are learning for the domestic philanthropy is i'm just looking at this kpmg uh, survey that was brought in 8649 crores have been set aside uh, for the development and i was looking at the report 269 pages not a single mention of work towards the marginalized communities is mentioned now how can we have i think this disrupt philanthropy is very very important that we cannot have women's development without ensuring that there is a sufficient amount of focus and perspectives in the participation we cannot have disability addressing the issues of communities disability with their without their participation and we cannot have marginalized communities like scheduled castes scheduled tribes and the several occupational things and i think even health wise anshu was saying leprosy and now in covid also we have been completely been excluded and in all major disasters they have been excluded so how do we look at the participation of these communities in the designing not just as as recipients in the designing and in implementation and therefore strengthening the agency of these and i think this i would i would uh, leave it saying that when we are looking at philanthropy i think we need to look at all the four principles which unicef talks about the child development that we have to look at of course the survival and lot of the programs of the programs of the philanthropy that we're talking about is mostly survival roti kapda makan but what about the development of higher education of entrepreneurship of land and access to capital but then it's not that enough we need protection you see the kind of violation of their human rights that is happening and then finally we need participation i think without these the philanthropy that we are really pushing will not level the play uh, playing field but and will not address the inequalities but continue to heap inequalities on uh, uh, in, in the society and therefore uh, will not really address the major focus of access to justice and peaceful societies that we're talking about thank you very much sorry if i have <clears throat> no 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 please thank you thank you thank you so much paul and i think i'm asking all the uh, listeners to come up with the questions and all we have enough time after uh, you know all these uh, four sessions so we have enough time to really discuss a lot of things and paul to go on your point i think until unless we we make people a part of the planning part i think i always say that uh, till the time we will have the demeaning words like donor and beneficiary 
and we will not convert all of us in a stakeholder things actually will not change because often people like us find the problem and and we only find the solution and that's that's one of the biggest problem that's why maybe we are not able to see the issue uh the next issue is another uh, very important issue of gender of course we cannot cover it in uh, such a short time but uh, one thing which we saw in the in the philanthropy or also on the on the money giving in the in the you know resource giving part in the last uh, 18 months uh, first time it was completely uh, focused on the hunger the next time it was largely focused on the health so obviously whether you are talking about marginalized community or you are talking about mental health or you are talking about gender issues a lot of institutions who have been working in these areas are going through a tough phase although these issues also need much more attention even even the kind of attention we were giving it earlier now the covid has made it uh, certainly certainly more complicated but uh, before i uh, invite uh, shilata ji uh, we all know about a beautiful institution called uh, breakthrough and uh, many of us have been a complete fan of their earlier campaign called uh, bell bajao uh, gender domestic issues and all that so i think uh, let's uh, see a, a small video from uh, sohini bhattacharya a dear friend and ceo of uh, breakthrough uh, and then i'll introduce uh, uh, <coughs> and you know sri lal shilata ji and then take it forward over to you both My name is Shohini and I work with an organization called Breakthrough. Breakthrough has been working to transform gender norms to make violence against women and girls unacceptable for the last 21 years. We work with adolescents and young adults, the breakthrough generation who will actually make this possible in the long run. We use multimedia campaigns, community mobilization and leadership development as our main tools. At the heart of this is a gender equity curriculum called Taro Ki Choli or Gang of Stars that we use in government schools as well as in communities to build gender equitable viewpoints encourage adolescents to have difficult conversations on taboo subjects with their parents as well as with their peers and teach life skills in partnership with the education department of the Punjab government we have now scaled this up across 4500 government schools where a gender lens has been applied to the curriculum and 20000 teachers will be trained to deliver the curriculum as well as examining their own gender biases in the long run this is what we want to now scale up across india we currently work with 530000 adolescents and 3000 young adults across 14 districts in five states of north india during covid-19 it's this young adults our team change leaders in the age group of 15 to 25 who actually became our mainstay they reached out to the communities that we work in ensuring that they have dry rations and masks and sanitizers in place they took up a campaign on domestic violence to create awareness around it to share information on helplines and legal services and now that the second phase is over these team change leaders are actually training people in the villages on covid protocol and the vaccination processes we are really really proud of them in addition we have also created a whole communication package with ic materials radio jingles as well as public service ads around myths around vaccination and vaccine hesitancy in rural india we are encouraging all organizations to use this with their networks as well as with their communities we look forward to a gender equitable india where adolescents are at the center and gender equality is at the heart of everything but adolescents voices and opinions matter not just about their own lives and choices but about important things like climate change and inclusivity and diversity that's the world that we dream of thank you very much thank you thank you shoini and the breakthrough and uh, for the amazing work you guys have been doing and also i think uh, all of us must uh, look through the new videos of breakthrough which are some very small videos on these uh, vaccination issues very powerful uh, videos which we all need to really really scale up so uh, shilata ji you are known as uh, you know feminist activist research scholar and and uh, trainer uh, uh, she Shilata Bhatliwala is the is the next speaker 
and she is currently senior advisor knowledge building kriya an international organization that works at the intersection of gender sexuality and human rights and and it's a very complicated subject right now and it's a very uh, you know very wide spread subject because if i remember the image, images of last year when these millions of people were walking and a large number of them were women and and little girls and uh, you go back to the roots and you don't know you know what safe place is there for you and then you're also walking for so many kilometers then i remember as an institution uh, our 70 80% workforce of gunj is actually women okay. and uh, so we decided as an institution like all other institution that we will not in the initial months will not cut the salary and because we are not able to call them <coughs> uh, so the salaries will go and i remember a large number of calls from many of them where they just uh, said that you know money is fine thank you very much but we do just call us for work we yeah. want to be we want to be out, out of, of that out of that room out of that on this note i am uh, leaving it on uh, you with a very critical question that how can the money giver committee or the resource uh, community uh, understand the gender issues better and fund these issues uh, much better i think the the understanding is grown but in the covid phase now that it is the, the problem is really really, really grown i am sure that we also need much bigger resources to tackle it over to you thank you thank you uh, anshu bhai so i am going to approach first of all uh, namaskar uh, assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to everyone in the audience and many thanks to the center for social impact and philanthropy and to the organizers of chacha 2021 for uh, organizing this very important panel um i am going to use a few slides uh, to make my point so let's hope this works and um i think that will explain better uh some core points that i think we need to um address in order to um uh, understand what really has to happen for philanthropy to play its uh, uh role in um in supporting and advancing um uh, gender equality and equity equity and equality are not synonymous so we have to be careful about what we mean by each of them so i call this um how to build a rocket ship or the lessons that philanthropy can learn uh on how to advance gender equality so i'm being very consciously provocative here because i want to take us into a slightly different world and say okay what happened when they wanted to build the first rocket yeah uh or the first spaceship uh what did they do first of all the people who were investing in that process of course at that time it was mainly governments but now it's uh, you know elon musk and um, jeff bezos and god knows who else but you know you don't know how to build a rocket ship you want a rocket ship but you know you don't know how to build one so what you do is you bring in the people who have the expertise and a diverse range of people were needed with understanding of different aspects of the challenge in order to create a successful rocket ship so you, they were brought in then they were trusted because uh, the investors believed that they knew what they were doing and would get them there then they assumed that it will take some time they knew they were not going to have a rocket ship by day after tomorrow and that there are no quick fixes or silver bullets and they knew that there were going to be a lot of risks they knew that the first prototype may explode or fail to take off uh, i just want to check if i'm audible and if the slides are visible yes 
I'm audible? Yes, yes. Okay, great. So what was the result of that process of bringing in the people with the expertise, the understanding, the experience, trusting them to get you there, knowing it will take time, and being prepared for some risks and failures? The result was a rocket ship. And now all over the world, people can build them and send them into space. But when it comes to gender equality, and indeed, uh, and thankful to uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Paul Devakar, for bringing this out beautifully within the example of, and to Anshubai for bringing this uh, issue out so clearly. When it comes to social problems, when it comes to social injustices, Everybody thinks they're experts. So when it comes to gender equality, funders tend to begin, and I know what I'm talking about because I also sat inside the funding community for some years of my life when I worked at the Ford Foundation. They think they know how. They think they have the answer to how gender equality has to be advanced. Okay, Having never actually done it, gone into a community and tackled issues of in, uh, gender injustice or gender inequality, but they think they have the answer. And they have this silver bullet that's going to change everything. Here are some classic examples. Microcredit. Give the women a loan and they will transform their lives. Send a girl to school, it will transform her life. Uh, put women in a uh, political office, it will transform. So everybody thinks they have this one silver bullet that will change everything and fast. Worst of all, they are quite skeptical, if not suspicious, about the expertise of those who've been doing this work for decades. They worry that their money will be wasted or that if they consult us, we have a vested interest in getting their money and we won't uh, be uh, straightforward. And they think that all the tested strategies that we advocate, they're too slow, you see, because they are not silver bullets. And so they want visible, measurable results by tomorrow. It's all about, you know, the social impact investing where you have to see the impact in 12 months and 18 months patriarchy is at least 10,000 years old but we are supposed to dismantle it in 18 months through this little project by giving loans and sending girls to school and putting women in the panchayat and they don't want any failures they don't want backlash or setbacks but the fact is when you begin to challenge any power structure, the caste power structure, the gender power structure, there is going to be backlash. There is going to be pushback. There's going to be violence. There's going to be failures. There are certain things that are not going to work. And so the result of this kind of investing with these silver bullets and wanting to have, be able to count the impact by day after tomorrow is you get a patchwork quilt, bits of this and bits of that here and there. But the fact is that changing a very deeply embedded power structure like patriarchy, and especially a power structure that works very closely intersecting with structures like caste and like class, like economic power and caste power mm -hmm. and so on, it requires intervention in four domains. And you get these four domains when you use the gender at work framework and see how you have to create change from the individual to the systemic level. And you have to create change not just in the formal domain of laws and policies and resources, but also in the informal domain. So let's see what is where. So in the individual informal domain is what we call consciousness. That is how people look at themselves and look at others. It's about self-worth, confidence, attitudes, 
like casteism, deeply internalized. It's deep in the consciousness as are gender attitudes. On the individual formal side is our access to our rights, resources, services, entitlements. On the informal systemic side are these very, very deeply entrenched social norms, cultural beliefs, practices, stigmas, barriers. And in the formal systemic side, are our laws and policies and budgets and so on. Now, the fact is that silver bullets might be able to fix the two domains on the formal side. They may be able to increase access to rights, to resources, to services, to entitlements, like healthcare, like getting a loan, etc. They may also be able to improve our uh, faulty laws uh, improve our policies, increase budgets, and so on. But they are notoriously hopeless in addressing the two left domains, that is shifting people's consciousness and shifting the kind of belief systems and the social norms, caste attitudes, gender attitudes, practices, rituals, that actually is where people experience stigma injustice and exclusion equally strongly, not just in the form of uh, lack of resources and poverty and so lack of services, etc. And it's these two domains where tackling, without tackling these two domains, we cannot mm -hmm. achieve lasting change. So the problem is they think these approaches that tackle these domains are too slow, but in fact, they are faster in the long run because they begin to dismantle the deep roots of injustice. Here's another way to look at it. I'm going to run through this quickly. Uh, look at the barriers, for instance, that a poor woman, a Dalit woman, uh, a, a, a woman from an indigenous community, uh, a, a, a woman who is a sex worker or who is disabled or otherwise stigmatized or excluded, Look at the barriers she has to cross if her rights are violated or if she wants to access some resource or service. First of all, she has to be aware that she has this right. And vast majority of women in our country still simply don't have that awareness, which is why the work of groups like Breakthrough is so important because they're creating this awareness of their rights at a very early stage in young women. Once they have the awareness and they say, okay, I want to access this right or I want to access this resource, sorry, you have to get permission. As a woman, you have to negotiate. As a girl, you have to negotiate the family, men in the family, elders of the family, your mother-in-law, whoever, in order to access the right. If you manage to cross that barrier, then there's the barrier of the resources that you need. Maybe you need bus fare to go to the nearest police station and file a complaint uh, of domestic violence or, uh, uh, you know, uh, caste-based violence or sexual harassment in the workplace. But it involves costs. Maybe the service itself is going to be expensive for you as, as a person who, who lives in a, a, a low-income group uh, community. Then the services, the laws... The justice system has to be available. There has to be mechanisms in place. This is where the infrastructure for enforcement and enabling of rights comes into the picture. These have to be in place in order to access your rights. And then finally, the worst barrier of all is you manage to cross all these four and you reach the so-called service provider, the so-called duty bearer, the person who is supposed to protect your rights and, you know, prosecute perhaps the violators of those rights. And then you come up against this wall of these deeply entrenched negative attitudes and or the political power. So if a, a Dalit girl is raped and she cannot get, and we know many cases that have happened in this country in the last few years, she can't even get her complaint registered at the police station because the rapists 
are upper caste men with huge political influence. Or you go to court seeking uh, maintenance and the judge shouts at the woman saying you're a shameless woman to even be bringing these issues to the court because the judge's attitude hasn't changed. We've changed the law, but his attitude hasn't changed. We've changed the law, but the police attitudes haven't changed. So to put it very simply, I think the lessons for philanthropy are very clear and very simple. Social change is rocket science. Gender equality is rocket science. It is complex. And in fact, you need to learn and understand how social power is constructed before you can go about trying to understand how to shift it. There is no historical evidence that any silver bullet has ever created lasting change in society. In fact, on the contrary, giving women loans, sending girls to school, all these magic mantras, because as we know, these are addressing only one dimension of the social power structure and they leave out others. So just like rocket science, there's a science to creating social change and you have to have the humility to understand who do you learn that science from? And this is the crux. There are a host of organizations and individuals around the world, across the length and breadth of this country. We have a rich history of activism, particularly in the areas of, uh, say, uh, anti-caste work and uh, uh, work on gender equality. And they have been engaged in empowering women, advancing gender equality for decades. Now, these are not necessarily the people with the impressive degrees, but they are people who've actually built complex change processes on the ground, as well as in laws and uh, policies. Respect their experience, respect their expertise, talk to them, as my colleagues have said, listen, learn from them. They're not the gender experts brought in by KPMG. You know, who are the gender, uh, what is the gender expertise of KPMG? It's them talking to the Shohini Bhattacharyas, the Srila Sabatliwalas, the Madhumeras, you know, uh, the Kalpana. This is how they get their expertise, believe me. So respect and learn from those who have actually created change and don't push your own agenda. And advancing gender equality is like rocket science. So the only way to get there, in my view, is to learn from those who have experience in building this particular rocket ship. Let me stop there. We can go into detail. Absolutely. In the, absolutely, uh, absolutely clear, bang on. In any case, the, the patchwork and the band-aid is not a solution for, for anything. And you know, one of the things which I've been saying in a different context a little bit, I always say that uh, if you see the farming community in India, who farmers have been able to come out with a few thousand variety of rice. Okay. And they can add two arm ka kalam and create a third arm, but they are still called unskilled. And people exactly. like us who, who write two pager on them, we are yeah. called skilled and we will be That's consulted right. for farming. That's right. That's exactly. I think that lens has That's why I was changed. so happy when you brought out this point, uh, Anshuji, right at the beginning. Uh, it's a it's a critical thing. It's a critical thing. It's very. We, we all need to change lenses, and I think one lesson which COVID uh, has taught us, whether we want to learn or not, is <clears throat> that something failed miserably. Absolutely. And what is that something? And if we are rebuilding certain things, can we rebuild with the different lenses, different thoughts, different stakeholders? Uh, and for sure, in this particular cause, a huge amount of philanthropy or the resources are needed because uh, in this entire disease phase, a huge amount of resources is gone to the health or hunger. But this is also an important aspect, which is Absolutely. note and it Absolutely. needs you know, a lot of attention. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, there are a lot of questions which are coming coming up and we'll take it up in the last 45 minutes. Uh, third uh, chapter for today is another important part and that is the mental health. Uh, many of us talk about it. Many of us who work in this space uh, see the impact all across. Uh, 
with my covid journey uh, i think which has not been very uh, simple uh, many times i went to the doctors after this one years personal covid journey and i remember uh, last time visiting a doctor friend and uh, and he said that anchu you know i i had a choice uh, i i started getting very depressed very it, it, it became very tough for me and then one fine day i realized that the cause is that i am really really listening to a large number of patients every day and that is causing a lot of anxiety because every single patient who is coming to me is coming with lot of new aspects lot of lot of new things which are happening in this life and he said that a time came when i also started you know consulting and i started taking extra you know medicines or consultations for for that so it is a subject which is a very important subject which even within the family within the community we do not want to accept we, and then maybe that is how that is how it becomes more problematic now with the country going through this uh, tough you know financial phase family phase economic phase all kind of phases this needs uh, urgent attention uh, for sure and uh, i think raj marival is here and raj will speak about it Uh, before that uh, let me let me just uh, you know again as a tradition of this program uh, bring a small uh, video uh, from center for mental health uh, law and policy in pune uh, just a few uh, insight on uh, atmeta dr somitra pathare uh, is there from there gautam over to you and then we bring uh, raj to speak and i'll introduce her Atmeeta is not just uh, a community mental health uh, program. Atmeeta is uh, a public health movement for mental health. Uh, I like to describe Atmeeta as uh, for the people, of the people, and by the people. Our Atmeeta champions are community volunteers who are chosen from the same villages that they live in. Uh, and we only work in villages where the village community you know the panchayat the sarpanch and the leaders in the village agree that they do need a mental health service and that they would like uh, to have a local person who is mentored supervised and is then able to provide them with mental health services locally atmeeta champions not only provide uh, counseling uh, to people with common mental disorders Uh, but they also do a few other things so if somebody has a severe mental health problem uh, they will refer them and link them up with the public mental health service and ensure that they go and get that help that they need uh, they also provide help in terms of social care which is to help people obtain their social benefits of which they are entitled to which might be things like a uh, manrega job card disability benefits uh and widow's pension and such things and the fourth thing that they do which is very important is uh, they have a uh, short films which are loaded onto a smartphone and handed out to these volunteers and they narrow cast as we call them these films what we mean by narrow cast is uh, talk to a few people in small groups to try and raise awareness about the antecedents for mental health problems so these are all the tasks that they do as volunteers they spend one or two hours uh on an average in a day uh working on this and over time the atmeeta volunteers get to be known as people who you could go to if you had any kind of a mental health issue during the covid crisis this was particularly useful when we had the lockdown what it meant was every village had at least a mental health for a uh, first responder who could provide immediate help and support to people in that villages for the last 5 uh, or 6 years now we have developed this service in around 500 villages in the district oh, i think some disturbance happened yeah uh, but thank you thank you dr samitra uh, we all understand that it's a, it's a science it's a, it's a art it's a it's a subject you know which uh, needs a lot of attention raj i'll i'll bring you raj is the director mariwala health initiative a grant making and advocacy organization 
working on accessible affirmative right based and user centric mental health care raj also serves on the advisory board of the global mental health action network a global joint advocacy and communication coalition on mental health and raj uh, you know uh, with you here uh, for sure why this issue is so important right now it has been very important but this particular pandemic has certainly now we need more attention for for sure and why it is important to bring more resources to the institutions who are who are taking care of this very crucial a uh, very hidden kind of uh, subject over to you raj thanks thanks so much um thank you for that introduction and i'm so very glad to be here especially honored to be talking alongside such esteemed and experienced co-panelists um so you know when i first saw the title of this session next philanthropy uh, the title running in my head was like it's 2021 and we are still talking about these issues in an introductory way um so my first thing before i even start to talk about mental health is that we as indian philanthropists and donors need to step up and do better so let's apply the same principles of accountability transparency and impact to our own work before asking our partners for the same so in this vein today i'll speak briefly about why you can't afford to ignore mental health related funding uh before i start i may say things that could be disturbing or upsetting and so in case you would like to reach out the i call helpline offers free professional psychological support in nine languages the number is 9152987821 or you can email i call at i c a l l at t i s s dot e d u and what i'll do is i will put that in the chat box um okay of course uh, to talk because i'm not a psychiatrist i'll be drawing on my experience with mhi and currently we work on 26 projects with 23 partners across the country in rural areas urban informal settlements hilly regions and regions facing conflict like manipur and kashmir um some of the communities that we work with are farmers victims of violence queer trans communities dalit bahujan adivasi communities youth people incarcerated in mental health institutions the homeless and religious minority communities so to start off um i'm actually not going to drop any figures on mental health i'm not going to talk about the numbers of the people who live with mental health illness or concerns i'm not going to talk about the lack of psychiatrists i'm not going to talk about how many people live with depression or anxiety why because there's a problem with this approach um it's biomedical there's a focus on conditions or a particular mental illness now these are described as having a set of symptoms much like a physical illness so then the next step is of course treatment which could be pharmaceutical it could be some sort of allopathic or at the most there's some talk therapy and at the end then we are expecting to see some success in the form of reduction of symptoms now this very approach is problematic if we are going to look at funding mental health why because it centers what we call the treatment gap now the treatment gap is the difference that exists between the number of people who need mental health support and those who get support it's a very western centric concept and it's very often stated as the number of psychiatrists available per 1 lakh people in a country so the moment mental health is mentioned in india the lack of psychiatrists who are medical experts who require years of training that's brought up now if i contrast this with a few other countries the us which is 4% of the world's population um has as many psychiatrists as the rest of the world put together okay and they still have a huge treatment gap in mental health of about 25% the uk which is 4% of india's population has as many psychiatrists as india put together and the uk itself has a treatment gap of 25% india's treatment gap is about 80% um so clearly this is not the only thing we need to look at when we talk about mental health so when we are talking about mental health funders need to look beyond psychiatrists need to look beyond uh 
you know, words such as depression and anxiety. Uh, also, because the moment I say the small number of psychiatrists in India, funders think that this is an insurmountable problem. It's too expensive. And of course, one of the favorite, favorite words of funders, no impact. Um, so it's a very limiting narrative. And of course, I know why this narrative is used. It just underlines the urgency. The statistics sound very bleak, but more importantly, they're absolutely insufficient to understand mental health, especially around issues of access and the provision of better mental health. This, this approach actually ignores one of the key things within mental health, which is structure and systems. Um, so let's talk about which factors affect awareness, provision, efficacy, and access to mental health services. Now, for example, people in India who live with mental illness and who require mental health care either do not have accessible services or those who do manage to receive services do not get quality care that is affordable, easily available, and acceptable. Uh, now, Somitra spoke a little while earlier um, about the Atmiyata program, which is funded by MHI. Uh, and he's talking about a program in a village. Now, if I do a similar thing, if I do a similar biomedical thing as to physical health, I'm asking a psychiatrist to go and set up a camp in a village. How many villagers do you think are going to go over there and meet that possibly male psychiatrist from an urban location who may not speak in their native dialect? Very few. Even if I move out from a rural setting, what about those who don't live in the major metros? Is there anything there at all? The problem is that there is no presence of mental health at a primary and a secondary level. So for someone from a town to go to a tertiary or a large hospital, that can be intimidating, right? Especially if you have to travel for half a day, you're going to travel a long distance, you're going to pay for the travel, then you're going to pay for the health care, then you're going to pay for the medicine. Now, if I have to just take one condition, if I say I live with depression and I'm from a town, uh, the travel and medicine alone in a month is going to cost me 2,000 to 3,000 rupees. And I'm not even counting the possibility of taking a day off uh, from home and work and going into a big hospital to see a psychiatrist. And this is why the biomedical narrative is limiting. Access is a complex issue and mental health funding needs to solve for that first. Unfortunately, the biomedical narrative also invisibilizes a, a key uh, issue in mental health, which is the invisibility of mental health as a global challenge and as a development issue. And now, unfortunately, COVID has already shown us how mental health is impacted by and impacts a variety of social, economic and political factors. So mental health is a development challenge and cannot be seen in isolation of people's lives and contexts. And I'll give you two examples. First, social causation or the financial strain, the increased exposure to violence and food insecurity linked to poverty combined with reduced access to social safety nets, such as food banks, income support, uh, all increase the likelihood of people develop, developing mental health problems. And Everyone has seen this in COVID. Everyone, as I think Anshu was referencing, migrant workers. Now that increases the likelihood of mental health issues. Conversely, most people with mental health issues also face barriers in availing proper education, finding jobs, and in exerting their civil and political rights. Tomorrow's Independence Day. We should know that many persons who live with mental illness are still unable to access their right to vote. So again, if we move away from the biomedical narrative, we realize that we need a paradigm shift and we need to look at this in an intersectional manner, which takes on all the ways in which systemic and structural barriers all contribute to an individual's mental health. Um, so my first kind of pointer is poor mental health is both a cause and a consequence of poverty, compromised education, gender inequality, physical ill health, violence, and other such global challenges. In fact, mental health has remained invisible or actually, I, I would say actually completely invisible in development paradigms. It influences 10 of 17 of the SDGs, 
no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender inequality, sorry, gender equality and reduced inequality. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Maternal depression has been shown to increase the risk of poor infant nutrition, stunting and diarrheal disease. So if you want to influence better health outcomes for infants, you must ensure that pregnant persons are routinely given mental health support and routinely screened for mental health conditions. Similarly, if I look at another category, depression has been shown to adversely affect adherence to antiretroviral medication amongst those living with HIV AIDS. Again, to influence better health outcomes, mental health care and treatment should be integrated within HIV AIDS programs. So that means that we are considering the social context, we are looking at the intersectionality of mental health, because if no matter which area you're funding, you cannot afford to ignore the mental health component. Um, what do I mean when I say mental health? It means that we take into account that mental health is psychosocial. What does psychosocial mean? The social context influence and interacts with psychological, that is emotion, thought, feelings, reactions. So psychosocial interventions lead to better mental health outcomes, but they also lead to better outcomes in housing, in education, in legal support, in skill building. And if you're looking at mental health, you must understand that it's not enough to provide mental health services. Could we have um, provided talk therapy to migrant workers walking back home? Sure. Would that have really worked? No, it would be unethical to do so without linking to services that support livelihoods, shelter, and social inclusion. So the mental health problem is a problem of a care gap. It's squarely a development issue, an issue of inclusion, and it's a critical path to addressing inequality. And so, and so it's very imperative to invest in, especially for LMICs. Okay. So funders cannot ignore mental health in India at all. Um, and finally, I'm going to end by saying, as a funder, if you look at rights-based work, it's very critical to foreground community voices and participation by acknowledging how systemic barriers and marginalization specific to their particular context affect an individual's well-being. I know many funders mostly say no to fund mental health because they're worried about scalability, and ultimately they cite that as a reason for not funding. Uh, but I'm going to say that, I'm going to ask you to consider, is scale possible without inclusion? Psychosocial intersectional work is at the crux of inclusion. So don't fall into this trap. Don't fall into the awareness trap. Um, it's unethical to fund for mental health awareness if there's no one to talk to at the end of that awareness building. Um, so... To end, I'm going to say that as Indian funders, you have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to fund, not to start our own programs, because you must keep communities at the center of mental health programs. And the only path to a holistic, universally accessible mental health ecosystem is through challenging structural inequality, countering systems of expert knowledge, such as psychiatrists, privilege and power from the margins because mental health is a development issue and it's a social justice issue. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And, and we will come back to you because there are, there are questions in the Q&A. And one thing which I am also leaving for the money giver community and people of, you know, who are working on the mental health, uh, I am certainly worried about millions of people who are working in this particular sector, which is called the social development sector and the kind of causes we all are, are working you know, unfortunately, as I always say that we are in the business of finding more and more grief, right? We don't, we don't in, in all of our work, you know, even today, all four or five of us, whatever we are doing and the listeners of this, uh, you know, particular uh, uh, seminar or, or webinar, most of us are in that business of finding more and more people who are not happy, right? And we are trying to solve their problem. And I have seen this impact on my team for sure and many other institutions. Because, you know, if you are not affected by a disaster and you are going to a disaster hit area, that's a different issue. But you yourself are affected. You already have lost your family members or nearby or you were not able to arrange for oxygen or whatever. And then you are trying to support someone with oxygen. 
right these are most of us are going through very complicated phase and there is no end to it we still have to work on even if we solve one problem of the society we are working on more and more problem so i think the the money giving community and the mental health professionals have a much larger uh, work for this particular segment also of thousands of caregivers whether they are in the medical fraternity or they are in the social sector people whether we are called you know frontline worker or not it doesn't matter but we all are and we all are going through this uh, tough phase thank you thank you so much fourth segment of uh, this uh, you know charcha is an interesting uh, one again and uh, i feel that again the northeast is at the end only at the end of the day you know we are talking about northeast and uh, it i always feel and many of us feel that it never gets its uh, you know due attention it is is far off we don't understand that this is basically millions of people and many many states together i mean this is one area where you have the maximum number of states if you see the number of states uh, that way uh, so we will we will talk about uh, what is the monetary situation what is the funding scenario in the in the area there uh, we know through our work also that there is i mean a large number of people with uh, you know because because the distance is so much because access is a bit complicated because it is already ignored because also a large part of it is the, is the victim of the frequent disasters you know the way are some floods are not even considered floods we don't even talk about it although it it affects millions of people every year so whether uh, you know this area is getting enough uh, attention enough monetary resources or not and what else do we have to uh, do for that but before uh, uh, you know i call dr sayed kazi there is a there's a video uh, from seven sisters development alliance or uh, sesta and i'm just uh, li- giving you a little bit warning that this video will have lot of uh, noise because somehow the people have done it and we are we are thankful to them that they are still able to send it to us uh, so just bear with that noise and after that i'll introduce uh, dr kazi and bring him here to talk about the northeast and the and the philanthropy part kato i'm indeed happy to say a few words on the philanthropic work sesta has been engaged in during the covid-19 pandemic this works are mainly confined within 60000 families in 745 villages spread across 16 districts and 32 blocks in three states in northeast india that is assam meghalaya and tripura sesta's main focus is on livelihood promotion sustainability and income enhancement sesta's frontline workers are mainly involved in providing help and security to these villagers at the time of their distress sesta at the time of first wave of covid itself has come out with the concept of nutrition garden as many as 40000 families are covered under this scheme for sustainable livelihood support entrepreneurship training programs are also being organized mainly for migrant workers returning home at the time of lockdown period the purpose of the of this program has been to provide avenues for alternative skills development and livelihood support some other work sesta engage itself are sri paddy cultivation livestock rearing and also providing help and support to the areas of rights and entitlements of women farmers 
SESTA has also arranged to support these rural communities by other means, like distribution of ration kits as well as medical kits, arrangement of awareness program for COVID-19 vaccination, livelihood restoration through distribution of visitable seeds, then provisions for both online and offline training program. Thus, SESTA's workers based in remote areas are able to meaningfully engage themselves with the rural communities to help them to achieve the desired goal of sustainability and livelihood security. I feel SESTA's continuous strive to bring in an inclusive society is indeed praiseworthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goswami. So let me uh, bring uh, Dr. Uh, Sayed Kazi, um, important subject for the Seven Sisters and this entire big area of the uh, population which often feel people feel that is ignored and it needs more attention from the development sector and all the all the components of uh, doctor, you know development sector dr kazi uh, has experience of working in the development sector since uh, 2002 he was associated with the center for agriculture and rural development one word south asia and digital empowerment foundation uh, he has also founded the northeast development foundation a not-for-profit society working for sustainable development in Northeast India. And Dr. Kazi also uh, founded E-Northeast Award, a regional platform for digital innovation and practices in Northeast India. Just, just a little bit of biorata, whatever I am able to pick up uh, from the full page of as of all. Over to you. And then after you, we all will uh, come for a discussion and the, and the charcha as, as it is called. Uh, hello, uh, sir. Could you please uh, connect your earphones and there there is a more options on your screen. You can just check the audio and video settings there. Or if you can unplug your earphones, I think we should be able to hear you. Please try to speak, sir. Uh, Dr. Kazi, uh, could I request you to uh, reload your browser, sir? Uh, let's wait for a couple of minutes. I'm sure it'll be okay. Can am I audible now? Yes, you are, Dr. Yes. Razi. Please go on. So I think uh, this incident of connectivity is, I think, needs to be looked into more desperately for the region. Uh, we are still struggling with low bandwidth, low spectrum allocation, and so on and so forth. But who will come first to invest? That is the main question. I think far flung areas, typical geography, terrains, and all those challenges. So first of all, thank you. Thank you, Anshu. I'm glad to see you because we hear from Northeast, hear a lot of stories about you and other people. You know, of course, uh, you know, uh, Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy has been doing a lot of programs recently, also during COVID. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. And because, of course, there are many organizations in office who are certainly doing good work, like SESTA, that the video that we saw. 
and there are many who are uh, trying to do best as possible with limited resources and whatnot, number one. Secondly, uh, 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 happy Independence Day in advance to everyone. And so tomorrow we celebrate the fifth year of independence. And uh, so I think we have come a long way, you know. Of course, we are still struggling with uh, so many things of proper so-called, you know, accurate national integration. There are a lot of conflicts, fictions here and there, border disputes in the recently that you heard from Northeast. So as uh, I think Andrew has also mentioned, the page three may jo Uttar Purwali jo Bar Wale scene hai. तो ज्यादा अच्छे खबरें जो होते हैं अच्छे न्यूज़ शायद वहां तक पहुंचने में अभी भी दिक्कत है ऑफ कोर्स दिस सोशल मीडिया एंड ऑल हैज हेल्प्ड अ लॉट विद द अल्टरनेटिव मीडिया प्लेटफॉर्म्स बट स्टिल वी आर ग्रैपलिंग विद ऑल दिस अदर चैलेंजेस सर्टेनली विद ऑल व्हिच आल्सो इंपैक्ट्स द टाइम एनर्जी रिसोर्सेज ऑफ लीडरशिप एंड ऑल बिकॉज़ अटेंशन कहां जा रही है फोकस कहां हो रहा है कहां जाना चाहिए द टाइम एंड द एनर्जी एंड द इन्वेस्टमेंट so those prioritization also gets affected in that process uh, so thank you uh, uh, center for social impact and philanthropy uh, for inviting me for this charcha 2021 and especially in grade that she uh, wrote to me and inviting me thank you so much first of all and uh, so uh, as 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 one of the speakers uh, has mentioned that that, that topic itself uh, certainly uh, we are looking at Uh, we are discussing in a scenario where uh, we have been exposed to so many uh, situations uh, unseen unheard or or unimagin unimaginable situations uh, so we were not prepared uh, because we were into a different uh, paradigm of development csr investment philanthropy and and and, and so on and so forth for a long time but suddenly uh, i think the covid has uh, you know it's kind of a you know uh, upside down kind of a thing where uh, so many things have been exposed whether you call the institutional structures the systems of access or delivery because we hear a lot of investment crores or thousands of crores have been invested in uh, you know every year annual budget and all we hear a lot of stories a lot of news a lot of data a lot of things but uh, but covid certainly has also talked about ki where this investment is going actually how this investment has really impacted uh, both public investment government investment in the name of social security health education and so on and so forth and as well as probably the question is also about the private investments uh, the through csrs or philanthropy and things like that because or probably the question could also be how sustainable has been this investment how impactful has been this investment in order to make community resilient actually resilient in terms of facing any uh, you know uh, such kind of situations as you mentioned and sure that about the annual floods uh, and also the landslides and also so many things there are so many problems across the country and also north specific has problems on its own so probably one thought is this in terms of probably covid has also probably forced us to think about the kind of investment that we are making whether it has been sufficient or effective not effective in fact impactful not impactful measuring the impact also probably uh, it has exposed uh, for all of us both for research advocacy or for as well as for implementation also so that you know we look at new way of as you mentioned also नई तरह से हम कैसे किस नई तरह से हम चीज़ों को देखें समझे और चीज़ों को बैक रूम में जाके फिर से हम वार्तालाप करें चर्चा करें एंड वी काम विद अ न्यू स्ट्रेटेजी एंड अप्रोच सो एवरीवन हैज टू बी ओपन टू दैट थॉट प्रोसेस ऑफ गोइंग बियॉन्ड द ट्रेडिशनल मोड और सेट नॉर्म्स ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग एंड परसेप्शन यू नो दैट यू नो दिस इज गोइंग टू वर्क एंड नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क आई सिंक दैट इज अनदर पॉइंट एंड एंड नेक्स्ट पॉइंट इज Uh, certainly about uh, that uh, uh, because the four themes that you mentioned that initially also ek to hai gender ek the marginalized community that uh, uh, paul has mentioned very uh, uh, minutely then of course the gender aspect that she lata ji has so so nicely i enjoyed her also the way she uh, uh, dissected those interpretations and thirdly of course about the uh, mental, mental health, health. 
which is certainly as an as a speaker uh, of course I, uh, I my apologies the name I couldn't collect uh, Raj 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 yes mm -hmm. Raj has mentioned that you know because when investment happens social investment the impact देखते हैं या ये कितना हम कर पाएंगे नहीं कर पाएंगे those kind of thought process probably has to now has to change if you really want to make our society really inclusive sustainable and and so on and so forth and lastly the topic that you mentioned about northeast uh, i see that the the moment you just narrated the themes i see that uh, northeast is is and should be also considered as an area of subject of investment irrespective of all the mental health gender education health everything falls within the larger social investment no doubt but why also we need to talk about northeast as a specific area of investment as uh, probably that is uh, is another uh, thought that strongly we carry now and also we are trying to advocate um, uh, in this part of the uh, country uh, so gautam i have a small slide a few slides uh, so do i share now from the, my machine am i allowed to share So I'm trying to. Yes. To yeah, Dr. Kazi, thoda jaldi karenge so that we at least have half an hour for discussions also. Yeah, if you can wind up a little bit fast, your slides. Is is it coming? Yeah. 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 We aren't able to see the slides, sir. So, so far, have you clicked? Yeah. yeah. we can see it now sir okay okay thank you so since i'm sitting in this of you know so I allow that kind of uh, gaps in internet networking and so with some slow some some disruption will also happen in my uh, this thing yeah. uh so uh, yeah uh, i just thought of putting this uh, uh subject across to all of you Uh, i may be correct i may be wrong i may be whatever but this is a strong conviction that we carry that i am just trying to uh, share something uh, with all of us and all uh, so uh, how do we unlock because uh, the whole anthropy or csr uh, thing in the northeast india not this part of india uh, and then of course how do i change okay okay so so can you see is it visible or should i enlarge the screen is it okay yes fine oh, okay okay so uh, as in rest of the world as rest of the country uh, of course covid has uh, also affected uh, uh, northeast india and though there may not be uh, so many studies or um, uh, mainstream media focus or highlights there are of course stories of migration migrants into reverse migration and then also uh, uh, statistics that i have of 30 to 60% of workforce in the primary sector which has largely informal and unorganized uh, sector they are affected because this sector has got closed down primarily in the uh, because they work in the primary sector and also uh, uh, statistics of how unemployment rate has gone up to high as 41% in state like tripura during covid and all uh, 41% and then also uh, there are various news that have also come out about the health system not could not respond the way that it could have responded uh and also uh, and, and 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 so on and so forth so uh, uh and in fact it's uh and maybe it uh, the covid story for northeast is also more of an invisible northeast how the stories could have evolved uh, could not have evolved could have evolved and also and also the the uh one of the key players to also share the stories and uh, make you hear and listen in other parts of the country through the civil society organizations in the northeast they also got badly affected because they were crumbling they were just uh, fire fighting what to do what not to do because they are also messengers of um, uh, information uh, you know uh, promotion telling you the story and and what not and also upar se jo bhi do cheeze jo hua hai csr amendment kiya gaya hai fcr amendment and all 
So that was another uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, nail on the coffin kind of a thing, you know, where suddenly overnight and all, because upar se paisa resources, not this in civil society, mein waise hi kam aata hai, aur uh, kaam to kar hi rahe hai, uh, but upar se achanak suddenly aisa agar aata hai, then certainly you can feel how organizations were trying to just juggle around and suddenly some kind of a organization, act, you know, disruptions, so-called disruptions happening. Uh, this clearly, of course, few organizations like UNDP, Dasra, and few NGOs also we came together, like uh, Sesta, you know, we came together in office. And now also we are just uh, discussing something with Adelgi also, how this uh, civil society organization, at least the mid and small, of course, there will be not many mid and small size could be uh, organizationally strengthened also. So, I, so that is one part. Secondly, COVID ka story nahi aana or uh, documentation nahi hone ka matlab ye bhi hai ki how many universities or colleges have also come forward in terms of documenting stories in the northeastern states, uh, which is also a part of learning, could have been part of learning, knowledge sharing or uh, you know, advocacy within government and all. So those are kind of limitations because so idea aana, man mein idea aana, dimaak mein aana, with turant innovate karna, or strategy change karna because this thing doesn't comes overnight you know because these things take a lot of time of you know that in the process of working that way super sham usi mein kaam karna sochna usi situation mahol mein rehna which other ngos or other organizations or institutes in other parts of country they are very prompt in response in terms of those responding also to those first layer of uh, promotion uh, batana stories studies and so the and things like that. So those things doesn't happen as much as should have been or could have been. Though we did a, a study on the uh, civil society to response during COVID in Northeast, and, and, and that is one thing. And and uh, so those are just initial thoughts of uh, how COVID has affected and 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 also the vulnerable communities like the T tribe community in Assam, which is the 20% of population of T tribe in Assam. They, just got suddenly affected because tea production may affect Hona, uh, buying and selling affect Hona, market got affected. And also 20% uh, uh, of population means they produce 53% of total India's production. And by, if you all know that, and global India is the second largest world uh, in the world, uh, but still India may 53% is produced by Assam, this 20% population, especially the women workforce. So under suddenly yes, all the collapse on our system and you know payment regularly nahi aana, ah, fir or upar se wage itna 170 rupee wages and all koi ji sakta aaj ke tarikh mein and that also become a political issue in political election time mein. Sarkar ne kaha ki ham 50 rupee bada dete hain election ke 10 din pehle bata hai ham bada dete hain aur election ke baad usko hi cancel kar diya high court ne stop kara diya because this industry lobby tea lobby gone to the court and say all this so you can understand all these things uh, you know how covid has affected the stories are equally very gloomy and very uh, you know uh, uh, sad and very uh, anxiety wagera but probably wo bahar aana logon ka nature of talking because or uh, the means and mediums of bahar aana or upar se bahut sari cheeze matter karta hai aisa nahi hai because aisa su awaaz sun ab news nahi aa raha hai kuch nahi ho raha hai aisa nahi ki nahi ho raha problems equally exist unemployment poverty hai. and by the way and my, if you can see my slide uh, you can see of course 50 million people are 4% of total population of uh, india's whole population and uh, but and 9% of total land area uh, then you can see landlocked hai, ye sab hum jante hai. but most important thing a lack of industrialization where we also talk about philanthropy or CSR, why they will invest, who will invest, unka impact kya uh, As you say, Sri Lata ji, that after uh, centuries, centuries age problem you want to solve in 15 months, the indicated data, that is why sometimes I feel so deserted also, so frustrated sometimes because we need to work. But you know, put in you put us in the time zone and data zone and all. No, but how do you create those impact? And then, the, of course, the ecological and the environmental concerns or the resource richness of the region also you need to keep in mind. Being the sixth ecological hotspot of the world, northeast. And by the way, abhi jis tarah se jo bhi urbanization, so-called urbanization ho raha hai, without any foresight, insight, and all. I don't know how the region will respond to the uh, frequently it's not earthquakes Anna, as you have heard I think frequently there have been earthquakes 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 recently in recent months and weeks 
So these are all indications of how our development ecosystem in the Northeast could be seen, not from sitting in Delhi, but probably this ecological thing, the culture of the people, the tribe of the people, the mindset, the needs, the history, region, how we customize those things and also look at the whole philanthropy and CSR investment in the Northeast could also be seen into, uh, taken into consideration, not just that we have a scheme, a name, a branding, a subject. Implement karna hai. So I think that is mm-hmm. what we are looking at. It. Then the strategical part, uh, you know, the because it's, it's uh, northeast is bounded by five countries: China, Sri Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Bhutan, and, uh, and Nepal, and things like that. And also you have the Southeast Asian countries on the other side of the northeast. So if you are saying that north is strategically important, it is a very you know very sensitive zone. Mein hai. Uh, bordering with such critical neighbors ke saath hai. so what is that level of investment also we are trying to put who is also as a national priority as a national interest also are we looking at that investment csr philanthropic investment who is going to look into what is going to who is going to bring them who is going to advocate them if you really think the north is really needs to also come on board and become resilient being all this in a strategic very uh, sensitive area and upar se years of insurgency abhi bhi insurgency ka elements khatam nahi ho raha kuch elements abhi bhi hai kuch news abhi bhi hai unemployment itna jyada hai kuch rozgar nahi hai so all these mm-hmm. things are, are, are equal dr uh, dr kazi sorry sorry to interrupt main normally aisa karta nahi hu but because we just have about 20 minutes and and you know one thing which i uh, feel very strongly that in the next charcha or many other forums and also CSIP, we certainly, certainly have to have different and very large conversations about uh, Northeast uh, as, as a very big geography itself. Because what you have said in one of your slides, that is a lot of things that are saying. And that means that this is a lot of attention in every situation. All of us really need to pay uh, more attention. So uh, I think uh, we will have to conclude it so that we at least have 20 minutes to uh, answer some of the questions. Right. So I will take another two minutes. Is that yeah, yeah. Please, minutes? please. And yeah, in this slide, uh, the, the latest data here in Northeast has got the highest people below the poverty line. It's 34.28 percent, almost 35 percent of poverty people below. We, we, many people, many of us doesn't know. We don't know. We we, we don't know this. So this is where the story is. It's not coming out openly, glaringly, or you not. Know. And also, this there are many aspirational districts. The district aspirational the northeast me ya same jeta tera chaudas districts hai aspirational districts hai. And also, as per the latest Niti Aayog data and statistics. Uh, the region is performing so bad in education, health, gender equality, zero hunger, and uh, things like that. So this, uh, all the Niti Aayog reports in the last two, three years has been saying that to us. Uh, so quickly, this philanthropy, of course, there are a distinction between philanthropy, CSR philanthropy, and CSR investment. I'm trying to distinguish that. There are hardly any philanthropic investment except for Tata Trust and APPI as implementing philanthropic initiative has done. But Tata Trust has been trying its best as much as it could. It has been trying to invest in the region. And then the CSR philanthropy, not much. Of course, no data information, no documentation proper and all. And CSR investment, these are the data, only 3% of total CSR investment in Northeast, uh, uh, vis-a-vis Northeast in uh, entire India. And you can see states like Meghalaya, Nagal, and Mizoram are hardly they get CSR investment and things like that. Uh, next is, uh, so how do we do? How, because uh, COVID, post-COVID, mein, of course, the first story is the historical story. You know, CSR, philanthropic investment, how much is it? Jada, we all know, we should be knowing. But also post-COVID, what we should do, what will be the focus strategy is, I feel, of course, first could be CSR, advocacy, persuasion, whether do we make it mandatory also, the some percentage or has to spend in Northeast, because that is where the national prior, national interest is involved in that also. So how do we help? Because there's no industrialization. And also we must know that in 1996, Supreme Court has banned all forest activities in the North is because it has to maintain the green cover of the country also. So who, how we are compensated for that also is the region. If we can't do it, the region is topography, the ecosystem is to save it. So what will we do? What will be the activity then? Who will compensate and all those stuff? So those kind of things has to be taken into consideration. Then the CSR philanthropy, yes. And philanthropy, of course, there are of local philanthropy also, but we need to just see how it can be mobilized and invested in the region. 
but probably policy ka intervention ki zarurat hai maybe yes we feel that is what we yes otherwise nobody is willing to invest the way they will, we have been invest on the three percent aap bataiye what we can do on that uh just another two slides uh and show i just took so this is one uh uh this is one uh, table that is in front of you you can see the investment level northeast me yahan se aata hai jo assam meghalaya nagaland and all those so this kind of investment that we have uh, and uh, uh, next is of uh, these are the areas uh, in northeast me jo bhi investment jyada focus karte hain aksar for uh, education health poverty sustainable gender and all you can see the percentage and all numbers and and as i told you the niti ayog ka jo statistics even after 48% spend ki education skills mein to why the niti ayog report is still saying that where is the synchronous happening where is the synergy happening and all otherwise why 48% to acha khasa hum ko respond milna chahiye tha humko so where qualitative investment focus investment sustainable investment implementation impact are equally important beyond investment also what are the things that we have for implementation planning and design and things like that uh last slide what is the last slide yeah this is the last slide uh yes uh, how do we enable accelerated uh, philanthropy and csr presence in investment in northeast do we see it is a national priority area development area strategic region if we consider investment special investment so certainly we need policy support in that case if we really want to see the csr investment philanthropic investment coming in a big way in the region to help the region and the people but that is also about whole uh, there are so many things decisions are taken on so many considerations also i understand uh, and do we also consider regional imbalance as a factor in csr and philanthropic investment why should not we why should not we that is my question is tribal area development the most tribal population is also in the northeastern states why we cannot have a kind of a say that this should be another criteria of philanthropic and csr investment it could be area of research also then community mainstream investment program as paul has also mentioned and probably uh, in case of northeast it could mainstream it could mean other thing that is also on the regional mainstreaming also or how do we invest in the people the region the needs some okay, health infrastructure crumbling hai unemployment high hai education is crumbling you know the poverty is very high as i mentioned so what do we do that so and also another area to look into is critical infrastructure development program in terms of, i'm not only in those roads and highways i'm talking about social infrastructure largely social infrastructure also we need to invest in health education livelihood and so on and, and so forth so with those thoughts uh, uh, the final comment would be that uh, yes uh, the philanthropy if, if, uh, next level of philanthropy beyond covid probably how do we convince how do we advocate how do we uh, tell the uh, the funders and the givers and the platforms and so on and forth key and also please look into us also invest in us you know be with us stay with us give time with us and all otherwise uh, you know aake chale jana kuch invest karke chale jana is kitna big symbolic de ke chale jana but in properly in left you know inherent investment jo gehrai tak jaya roots tak jaya proper investment hota hai us tarah ke cheeze bahut zaruri hai along with research and studies are equally important and and that is what also we are trying to do and on 20th of august we are also organizing a program and a, a, a policy brief discussion around bridging the csr divide in northeast on thank 20th you. of august we are doing that so with those thoughts i thank you uh, anshu and thank you everyone i uh, my pleasure to be here thank you thank you dr kazi i think it was very very informative just that we really really need time to understand uh, you know this is a very grave issue so let us come back to a small uh, you know i think i i would request all of us to uh, get into a small uh, dialogue because uh, we just have about uh, 10 minutes with us before we uh, sum it up and it has been a very informative uh, session and it's good that within like 1 hour 45 minutes we are able to actually at least touch upon four very different kind of subjects all the very very interrelated subject Uh, so one question to all uh, and and i think it's time to really have a very sharp and very uh, small to the point answer if we can give so that we can use this time very effectively uh what are what are these barriers you know which are which are affecting us in each of this issue and and whether the covid crisis has been able to really bring some attention on this or has been able to change certain lenses kyunki jo abhi 
the the conversation which was happening in the last one hour plus uh i think we most of us are saying that the lenses are still almost the same and people are still not trying to understand the gravity of the issues and maybe not many people are really aware that the issues have really grown much much bigger that way so from all of us uh, so if if paul can really uh, talk about that marginalized communities are these communities getting more attention or it is just limited to the migrant workers and giving food to the migrant workers and then when they settle down in their hutments we ignore them the moment they are out of sight we start ignoring them or raj can communicate that whether people are really understanding the and the development community that it is now a serious issue you know and and it needs more attention is something changing uh, has covid really done something good also to bring certain attention and 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 you know when lata ji was talking i was also thinking about the sex workers and transgenders that way you know i mean one of the thing which we have been saying that maybe sex workers and transgenders will be the last people to get back to their jobs in this entire scenario uh, north east we just heard a lot about the issue so over to you uh, paul raj and and lata ji to respond to this yeah. uh, thank you for yeah. uh, collecting this i think one is it the pandemic has only accentuated the existing inequalities and has shown us the gory face of several of these and it has shown us in the face of uh, marginalized migrant labor who mostly dalits and adivasis then the resilience there the courage they have showed but also another factor which has showed is new levels of communities who have not been part of the marginalized have been been forced into the marginalized i think that is something which is very very worrisome because because of economy and the kind of disruptions it has caused i think greater number of people have come in who otherwise were somehow eking their living out not that they doing extremely well and i think therefore the competition the space for uh, visibility as well as as well as the need for reaching out is much greater than what we are doing that is something that we'll have to really work so how do we work double the kind of a thing i don't think we can allow pandemic to restrict us but we need to be continuously be innovative to see how we can reach out in this very restrictive time i think this is something that the pandemic has as uh, is testing our own courage and levels to reach out to communities lata ji you can add something in then raj sure um i don't want to take much time because i think it's unfortunate that we couldn't hear from some of the uh, participants as well you know could have been interesting i just want to make one point uh, especially in the context of uh, covid and as you said not post covid but in a covid world uh, my concern and my worry is that even historically and traditionally particularly our indian philanthropies they always tend to see women in the victim role so it's always as a victim as a survivor you know rape survivor rape victim you know this this kind of thing and i think now in a certain way covid has exacerbated that uh, because we rightly had to draw attention to the very gendered impact of the pandemic yeah i mean uh, raj was talking about mental health i mean there has been a huge uh, trauma faced uh, uh, by women and this cutting across class and across caste but has been very very severe among uh, impoverished and and marginalized communities so i think the problem is that it has aggravated and reinforce this victim imagery for philanthropy and philanthropy loves to rescue they like to be the rescuer you know the one who rides in on a white horse and you know throws its money in and i saved all the you know there's a certain kind of a savior 
a very seductive savior um, framework that's operating there. It's very unconscious. It's very well uh, disguised in some cases, not so well in others. So I think what I would like to see, and I hope all of us can help to bring to the forefront where women are acting as managers of this crisis, where women are acting as agents in preparing communities. Because see, what women never do, having you know, been a uh, grassroots uh, movement builder for 25 years of my life, I can guarantee one thing. They never work on an issue basis. You know, you will never, that NGO specialize in, I'm a health NGO, I'm an education, I'm a mental health NGO, I'm a women's NGO, you know. They don't work like that. A. B, they think of the whole community, though they don't just think of themselves. But if you put women-driven solutions at the center and approach uh, women as primary agents of change, as, 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 as managers of uh, the impact of the crisis in communities and invest in those kinds of processes, I think that would be a fantastic long term because even Wonderful. in post-earthquake scenarios I've seen, when women have taken over the post-earthquake reconstruction, as happened in Maharashtra in, uh, uh, after the Latur. Uh, yeah, Latur earthquake, then the whole thing starts transforming. So if you're looking yes. for a silver bullet, that is it. How yes. do you invest in women as real managers of change processes and of managing impacts of crises like the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Raj, your comment and then Dr. Kazi. Yeah, Raj. Um, so I, I think in terms of to answer maybe what COVID has done, I, I would hope that it has made um, some of the connections clearer um, that a lot of this work, uh, it, development work, social justice work, um, must tackle things at the very upstream or must track tackle structural oppression. And by that, I mean, uh, there have been many communities who have been affected by COVID, but the ones who are disproportionately affected are communities who are marginalized by gender, caste, class, ability, sexuality, religion. Um, and it's not that they weren't affected before. They've always been in a crisis of care. Uh, this crisis of care has only been heightened simply because family, state, larger society abdicate their accountability and responsibility for those who do not conform to gender, sexuality, caste, class, uh, religion, and ability. Um, I, I think lots of change needs to be done. And maybe it's time for Indian philanthropy to really look at um, rights-based work that challenges cis, heteropatriarchal, brahmanical structures. That's one. Um, and I think the other thing is changes need to be made even here and now. Uh, the development field still talks about gender in a binary gender. We are still only talking, it would seem, about cis women uh, rather than trans women, not transgenders, because that's um, mm -hmm. not how we use the term. But yes, so that's, I'm done. Yeah. Dr. Kazi, you have any comment? Um, then we'll just sum it up. Any comment that, although although you explained it very well, that I think what from your angle we can see that North is okay. still uh, largely unattended that way. Uh, and the, the share, I mean, someone actually asked the question also, the equal distribution of the resources of the philanthropy money. But I'm, I'm sure as all of us feel that North is, is certainly a little bit uh, cut off and then of course, when North is cut off, all the communities we are talking about other three speakers, I mean, in any case, Normally cut off that in that process itself. Any other, any last comment from you? So my, yeah, my, my, my last comment is, uh, there's, a, there's a general narrative in the region that we are alienated for mm -hmm. so many things, to, you know, distance, resources, opportunities, and so on and so forth. There are a lot of things already talked about and all. So, and, and that alienation, and then you see the COVID thing also now, how in two years, how it has just you know, upside down, put everything haywire in the region. 
coming to the specific to the social sector, development sector in Northeast, although there has been a historical gap, development injustice or uh, you know, philanthropic investment injustice, injustice, I'm not saying just to blame anyone, just to say that, that, that focus or attention has not been there. Mm-hmm. But after COVID-2, there's more the challenge. And upar se aap wo jo FCR amendment hai, aapka CSR amendment wagara hai, to usse aur affected ho gaya hai. So now mm-hmm. the, certainly this civil society organizations are struggling, baffling, baffled, struggling, and a lot of anxiety, uncertainty. Because if you consider civil society organizations, frontal organizations to work with the community hand in hand with the government and all. So how do, where do they go now? From where do they go now? The issues are glaring, the problems are glaring, though it hasn't come out of it. And I put certain statistics to you after COVID also, this has been more exposed by the TIO report and so on and so forth. So where mm-hmm. does, apart from government investment, do we need to look at CSR investment, philanthropic investment? They need to look at the region as a focus of investment. On, for the nation, nation's sake, national integration's sake, national priority's sake, strategic interest's sake, if that is also could be considered by the donors and givers and funders, it will be great. Because that is Thank where you. the people needs to be mainstream also. Emotionally, everything comes into the picture in the post. So don't leave Thank the you. region. Focus on the region. I think you need to also Thank give you. attention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. And, and it's, a, it's a complicated job to uh, sum up the two-hour discussion in three, four minutes. But I am going back to a story of, uh, you know, Kerala floods when we were working there. And suddenly we started, we got two calls, one from one Tamil Nadu home and the other one was from Andhra home. These are caregiving home for, you know, uh, kids or destitutes or whatever you say. And then we realized that actually uh, they just wanted the basic food supplies, which some uh, people have been giving for years. But the moment uh, Kerala flood happened, that money was diverted to Kerala flood in the emergency. And the need of those two homes were not fulfilled. Okay. So what I am trying to say that many times the new money uh, doesn't come and the old money is diverted at the cost of certain causes which are extremely, extremely important for all of us. And today, to be honest, all the four things which we discussed that covers millions and millions and millions of people. Uh, almost uh, every second, third house is covered if you see such kind of issues which are happening in, in India. So that's a huge community we have been uh, talking about. So that's extremely important uh, you know, for the philanthropy sector, for the development sector to really look into uh, these issues. Uh, this is a change scenario that needs more attention. A lot of, lot of things will not give us immediate satisfaction or a good picture or a good report, but that will be a very long lasting work and it will be work. It will not be a patch up or a bandaid, but will be a root work, which I often say that, you know, it's about uh, treating malaria versus killing mosquito. So many of these things, if we work, uh, it is something like, uh, you know, killing, killing mosquitoes. We also need to just to sum up my own comment. I would say that, uh, when I see this particular disaster of the last 18 months, uh, I feel that it is something like large number of middle class people or the lower middle class people where, where the one generation struggles for life and then the second generation is able to do something. I feel that in many, many and hundreds and thousands of families with whom all of us are trying to work, they have really lost something which a generation had really struggled for. And they are, it is too early to say for many people to say that now it is a generation loss. But in many cases, we can see that, that they do not have a piece of land which they can sell again to bring a kid to the school. All that is over. So now it's, it's another generation which will be fighting uh, together. Uh, philanthropy lenses have changed a little bit, for sure. We have seen it in the last uh, few years. But I think it needs much bigger uh, changes. It needs to really uh, look uh, much, much deeper. And I would say that there are large number of so-called non-issues, which we do not consider at issue because those are not highlighted by the situation or by the media or, or those are not visible to us. So people walking are visible, but people settling down somewhere where there is nothing to settle is not visible. So how do we really bring the philanthropy lenses in the disruption mode to these invisible issues, to these non-issues? 
and to kill these uh, mosquitoes and not only treating uh, malaria my uh, sincere thanks to all four of you uh, to spend two hours uh, and all the people who had uh, this session with lunch or after lunch and a sincere thanks to csip uh, naj and chacha 2021 i think it was a beautiful experience it was an enriching experience and a lot to learn thank you very much all the best stay safe thank you anshu for thank you everyone thank you all the panel members and all the participants csip and gautam sakshi especially thank you so much thank you so much see you soon yeah thank you thank you right thank you nice to have met you all stay safe stay safe from thank third you. delta all and what not